It's good to see you here this morning and to fellowship with us. We're excited about the fact you're here. Some of our group are traveling. And uh, Thomas is in Amsterdam. And uh, Jeff is with his family on their way to Branson as they meet every other year someplace for the week. And the rest of us are here. We're staying here this weekend or this week. In uh, about two weeks, we'll be taken off to see our son and daughter-in-law and their family. Our daughter-in-law has ALS. And the latest word is that she is uh, decreasing at four points a month, which means that it is faster than the normal rate. And she had her birthday yesterday, and what did she have, 69? 61 bouquet of flowers from her church were delivered to her house. She spends about 80% of her time in bed. And she's been a very vivacious woman over the years. And uh, <clears throat> so we're taking a trip there to, to encourage her and her family. And, and I'm sure that we ourselves will be encouraged as much as you can be under these circumstances. In the meantime, let's take our Bibles and let's turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. In verses 1 and 2, I want to show you how this book is laid out. In verses uh, 1 and 2, what we are to be, our, Titus tells us what we are to be. Number 1. We're to be subject to rulers, to all authorities. Number two, we are to be obedient. Number three, we are to be ready for every good deed. Number four, we are to malign no one. We're to be peaceable. We're to be gentle. And we're to show every consideration for all men. Notice there's seven points in that two verses. What we were is seen in the next few verses. Verse 3, we were also once, were foolish ourselves, we were disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lifetime in malice and envy and hating one another. See how there's 7-7? Seven, seven? Then we looked at verses 4 to 6, and we see what a great salvation we have. The kindness of God our Savior, the love for mankind, according to his mercy, we see his mercy, the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Savior, and being justified by his grace. That's how it's laid out, 333. This morning we're talking about the kindness of our God and Savior, we're picking up that subject, and we saw it last week, that God is very faithful to us. He's kind in every way. The world sees God as their enemy. They curse him. They blame him for everything that's going on. They fail to see his goodness. And Thanksgiving this week will basically be Thanksgiving that I have a better life without God in many ways. Unfortunate. But we pick it up in verse 5, and he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. We talked about this last week. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, and quite frankly, theologically, that's a mouthful. He saved us. What does it mean when he said he saved us? He took us from hell, saved us from hell, and gave us new life. Last week, we saw a very interesting thing happen in our country. The eyes of the nation were on a courtroom. A man was being accused of murder. And he was arguing self-defense. And everybody was riveted on it because it has some really social implications to our nation. And when this went on, <coughs> this young... 18-year-old kid was on a stand and pled for his life. 
He could have been sentenced to life in prison. And then when the verdict came down the pike that he was not guilty on all accounts, did you see his reaction? He totally fell apart. The weight of guilt was off him. Now, shouldn't that be the way we feel when we are saved? We have a worse sentence on us than when we than he did. We had a sentence of hell forever on our backs. And we were guilty. Every one of us. We were guilty. And had not God saved us, and God not forgiven us of our sins, we would have no hope when we die, and we would spend eternity in hell. What kind of response should we have emotionally and physically when we realize we are guiltless? Someone else paid our price. Oh, I'm saved. I got saved in 1948. Is that our reaction toward our salvation? Are we taking it that much for granted? We have been relieved of some pressure greater than that young man knew. And I hope he knows. I hope he finds Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. That's my prayer. But what great salvation we have. What great salvation he had. So when he said he saved us, he saved us from hell. And he gave us all of the good things. Lewis Perry Chafer, the founder of Gallo Seminary, said 36 things. Robert Gramacki, a classmate of mine, Dr. Gramacki, said 84 and I think much more than that, if we really knew the truth, how much God has saved us from. And he did it not on the basis of works of righteousness, which we have done. We went through that. And you all know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, by means of faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that one may boast. We can't boast about this. We can be thankful of that. The best deeds a sinful man can do is considered filthy rags by God, Isaiah 64, 6. For we all have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like, filthy, like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf and all our iniquities like the wind that take us away. We were saved by his mercy. Take a look at Ephesians 3, verse 4 and 6. <coughs> mercy is that deep compassion of God for people, which motivates God toward kindness toward us who are in a pitiful situation. Or like that kid on a, on, on a stand. And the pressure's on. And God saved us. Came into the courtroom and said, I paid the price. Case dismissed. Ephesians 2, verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How did he do this? By the washing of regeneration. The washing here does not refer to baptism. And in fact, it's using washing as a spiritual cleansing from the filth and dirt that was on us prior to our salvation. In Ephesians 5, verse 26, if you just look over a couple chapters, 
from where we were, it says, so that he might sanctify her, set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Speaking of a woman that, who is married, to sanctify is to set apart. I don't know about your house, but I use that explanation. We have plates that are sanctified. They are set in a cabinet and we cannot use them every day. They're pretty thin too. We could break them. But that's what it means to be sanctified. You're set apart by God. By the washing of the water of the word. It's not baptism. It's a cleansing of the soul by the instrumentality of the word of God. I look in the Word of God, and here's what it says. And I'm not doing it. What's my responsibility? To wash the sin out of my system and do what he says. It cleanses me. It gives me a clear conscience. It gives me peace. It gives me comfort. It gives me joy. Thank God for the washing of the water of his word. Through regeneration. Regeneration is the first step in salvation, if you were to put it in orders. We already read it earlier. Ephesians 2, 1 says, We were dead in trespasses and sin. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, in John 5, 24, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed from death out of life. That is new birth. You are passed at the point of salvation from spiritual death to spiritual life, eternal life. John 3, 3, Jesus said to the Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. No way you can see it. You cannot go to heaven without having a change in our lives, being new, made new. In fact, by the way, we aren't going to heaven with the body we have right now. We have to lay it aside. We either will lay it aside in death or we'll lay it aside at the rapture and we will be transformed into the image of his dear son. We have to be born again. This body cannot go to heaven as it is. It's cursed. Uh, my daughter-in-law is experiencing that. You probably are experiencing that as you grow older. You're having problems where you never had them before. Can I encourage you? It will increase. <laughs> like the guy said, cheer up. Things could be worse. So he cheered up and it was worse. <laughs> Going to change. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The re renewing is a reference to something entirely new. We are being renewed. And if we've read this many times, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. It's the impartation of the Holy Spirit which makes us a new creation in contrast to the old things that we are, our selfish and our pride. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an influence. He's as much a person as God is a person. He as much as a person as, a, as Jesus is a person. And he lives within each one of us. And the Bible says, for the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
When we, prior to our salvation, you and I were slaves to sin. I don't know what church you may have gone or I went to. It makes no difference. Prior to our salvation, we were enslaved to the law of sin. We could do nothing but sin. Even our good things were filthy rags. When we repented of our sin and said, God, this isn't working. I'm a sinner. I, I got to change. When we poured our heart out to God, he changed us. And the Holy Spirit dwelt within us and set us free from sin. And he's working in our life even to this point. He keeps renewing us and bringing us to a point where we change our attitude. Where we yield our life to Christ. And Paul said, however you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, Romans 8, 9, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, <clears throat> he does not belong to him. <clears throat> At the point of salvation, each one of us received the Holy Spirit. It's not a second blessing. It's not a third blessing. You don't have to wait for it. You don't have to pray for it. You don't have to come to the altar and pray through. He's there. He's within you. You need to, and I as believers, avail ourselves of him. The whole Trinity is really involved in our salvation. God called us. We placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ who pro provided for our salvation and the Holy Spirit makes it real. In verse 6 it says, He poured out and upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. He is the Father in this verse. Everything we got at salvation is unbelievable. I remember the first time way back when I got a computer. I got a computer because I wanted a Bible program and uh, I wanted to be able to have a word processor. So I get the computer and I began working on the, road pro on the word processor and I began to notice there's a lot of other things this thing does. I mean, it's just unbelievable as I read through it, what happened and what happened and what's going on. And the same is true of our salvation. I remember when I got saved, one of the things I was happy about, I wasn't going to hell anymore. But I found out there's a lot of other things in this salvation package. As I opened the package of salvation and began to look at the various gifts that were in it, I realized there's a whole lot of things in this salvation package. God has richly poured on us. And of all the people in the world, of all the ages in the world, this is the best age, really, to have been saved. We are married to Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Take a look at John chapter 7, verse 38. Man, this is exciting stuff. Jesus said, He who believes in me, in John chapter 7, verse 38, He who in believes in me, as the scriptures have said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What does that mean? Water is a blessing. The true Christian, out of his life, has got to be one of the most encouraging people that live on this sinful, filthy world. Can people tell you're a Christian? What's different between you and Joe Dokes next door? What's different between you in high school 
and someone else in high school that's not a Christian if you claim to be one. What's the difference between you as a Christian farmer, businessman, wife, mother? What's the difference between you and the people around you? Can they tell? Out of your, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit had not yet been given... Because Jesus was not yet glorified. But go to John 14, verse 16, where Jesus promises this again. This happened after the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, I will ask the Father. He will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. We talked about this Wednesday night. Jesus is not with you personally. Yeah, he's with you. Spiritually, isn't he? He's in you. But he's really seated personally, physically, at the right hand of the Father, though in his divinity, he is everywhere present. Now that's a mystery of Christ. But you have God with you every moment, every day, whether you're sleeping or awake, and he is God, the Holy Spirit, living where? Within you. We don't call this room here the sanctuary. Because it's not a sanctuary. It's not a place where God dwells. Where does God dwell? In each one of you who are a believer. You're a sanctuary. I've been in churches where some people were in, uh, in church and they wouldn't eat in the, the sanctuary. Well, they eat in the sanctuary every day. This room is just a gathering room when we're here together like Sunday morning, like we are this morning, then the Lord is here. But God, a very God, lives within us if we're believers. And how should that affect us? God poured out the Holy Spirit in us at salvation, and this was done without measure and exceedingly abundantly. Exceedingly abundantly. Ephesians 3.20 now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think <clears throat> according to the power that works within us. So what limits this power? How do we quench this power? The Bible says don't quench the spirit. How do we quench it? We quench it when we say no to God. We quench, we quench it when we do not do what God has told us to do. We quench it when we don't confess our sin, when we don't admit we're sinners. We squelch the spirit within us. Dale Moody said, uh, when he heard a sermon like this when he was young, he said, I want to be a man in whom the spirit is not quenched. Well, we all know church history and know the story of D.L. Moody. We could all be D.L. Moody's in our own little neck of the woods. This church could be a, a powerhouse in this community if we'd all but yield to the Spirit of God. We have yet to see what God could do in this community through a group of believers like we have in this church. I challenge you, this Thanksgiving, be thankful for your own faith in Christ. And share that faith and live out that faith. And rather than moan and groan about what's going on, as we said earlier in this series, we should not be shocked when unbelievers act like unbelievers. 
And we should not be shocked when we see Christians acting like Christians. In Acts chapter 1, after Paul or Saul began to persecute the church, the church left Jerusalem and went everywhere spreading the gospel. God said to the church as he left the church in Acts chapter 1, go in, he said, go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. As soon after Pentecost, they all clung together. Wasn't moving. So God allowed a little persecution, and they scattered all over, fulfilling his word. Do not be drunk with wine, that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Being filled with the Spirit allows us to really be used by him. What is a drunk person like? Well, a drunk person, is an un, he isn't under control of his own spirit. He's under the control of what spirit? Spirit of alcohol. A spirit that causes him to act differently than he normally would act. He acts sullen or he acts bold and brash. Literally makes a fool out of himself. When we're controlled by the Spirit, we should allow the Holy Spirit to be in control. Maybe we consciously need at times to say, how would the Spirit of God handle this situation? What would the Spirit of God have me to do? Remember, we're saved. And from all that, through the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs of eternal life. The hope of eternal life. So that literally being justified, literally having been justified, refers to that aspect of our salvation whereby God declared us righteous on the basis that Jesus Christ bore God's wrath against our sins and paid the penalty of our sins. Wow. Just like that court case, I just, I, I just marveled, and, and I could feel for him as I saw him relieved. And I thought, I, I just go back, people. God declared us righteous. At the moment of our salvation, we received a judicial writ, as it were, a judicial paper that said, you are free. You are righteous in my Sight. Second Corinthians. Take a look at that. Second Corinthians five twenty one. Second Corinthians five twenty one. God He made Him Jesus Christ who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. A very strong point is made in the New Testament that Jesus is sinless. Would you agree? He's sinless. Very strong point. He didn't know sin. The only way he could have sinned was from the outside. We got a problem. We can sin from the inside as well as the outside. So the devil came, Matthew 4, Luke 4. The devil came and tried to divert Jesus. Now, personally, I don't think it could be done. For me, the temptations were not to see if he could sin. The temptations were to show he couldn't. He was righteous. He is God, and God cannot sin. 
And even though he's a man, he in the hypostatic union, the two of them are one. There are one nature. God is one. We study the divine nature, the human nature, but it's never so depicted in the Bible. The Bible never says this was his divine nature. The Bible never says this is his human nature. It always speaks of him as one person, fully divine, fully human. And the only way he could have sinned is from the outside. <clears throat> and for our benefit, what happened? The devil said, I'll try to divert you here. You're hungry as a human. Why don't you make this stone bread? Is that a real temptation to any one of you? You're real hungry and there's a stone in your yard about the size of a loaf of bread. And you're tempted. If I could only make this stone bread. No, you don't have that temptation because you know you can't, can't do it. But God could. Jesus could have made that stone bread. <clears throat> but to do so would be for Jesus to forsake the reason he came, which was to do the will of God. And it wasn't God's will to make it stone bread. So as a result, he didn't make it bread. He said the word of God is, says in Deuteronomy, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here's the point. It's more important for us to get the word of God in our system than it is for us to eat. Think that one over. Oh, it's Bible study. I don't think I need it. I don't think I need to read the Word today. I'll read it when I feel like it. One of the most important things for you and me is to be in the Word of God and to feed on it. <clears throat> Righteousness or I should say regeneration is an act of God does in us. Regeneration is not seen. It is seen in the works afterwards. How do I know you're saved? Because you tell me you're saved. How do I know you're saved? Because you say or can I see it? Remember James talks about this? Show me your faith. Well, faith is something you can't see, right? So how can I show you I have faith? How can you see that I have faith? The only way you can see I have faith is how I act. That's the only way I can tell whether you're a believer or not, by the way you act. The proof is in the pudding. The devils believe there is a God. How do I know they don't believe it? Or act, they don't act that way. How do I know you really believe? What change do I see in you? What love of God do I see in you? Or others? Regeneration is on the inside and it's secret in, the, in one sense. We don't know it happened except we see it. Justification, on the other hand, <laughs> means that God declares that we, have, that we have the penalty paid for past, present, and future. The moment you repented of your sin and believed in Christ, as your Lord and Savior, God said, I declare you righteous. In my sight, God says, as holy as I am, you're righteous. McLean, who founded the seminary I attended, put this as a, as a means. He said, God justifies the believing sinner 
on the basis of that satisfaction rendered fully to the divine moral law by God's own Son when he died for our sins in our place upon the cross. Romans 8.1 says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As a believer, when you die, you will not be judged for your sins. How will you be evaluated? By your works. By your works. You're going to go to heaven. You know what? Why did David say in Psalm 32, verse 1, how blessed is those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now we all know David's life. David committed adultery. He had an affair. He's a king. He's a man after God's own heart. So said before he ever met Bathsheba. He committed adultery. Now, he knew that was wrong. So he decided he's got to cover this up. So he invites her husband, Uriah, who is fighting for the country. And David is supposed to be where? In the front, fighting with his army. That's the way God arranged it. If Israel goes to war, the king goes to war. I'll tell you what, if our presidents went to war, there'd be a lot less war. <clears throat> well, he stayed home. An idle mind is the devil's workshop. And he let his eyes wander, and the first thing you know, he's committing adultery. So to cover it up, he has Uriah come home. And he says, Uriah, he calls Joab and he says, Uriah, come home. Joy your wife. Next morning, Uriah is right there by his office. Uriah, didn't you go home? How can I go home? I can't go home when my troops are fighting out there. Why would I be at home and fighting when all my men and the guys I work with and fight for are there. David, had he not been full of guilt, would have said, Amen, let's go. But sin kept him from being patriotic. So what does he do? He gets him drunk. Maybe he'll go home then. Didn't work. So what does he do? Bathsheba's pregnant. He says, okay, you go back. You need to fight. Take this note with you. What did the note say? Put him in the front lines. When he's in the front lines, you withdraw. Make sure he's killed. Is that patriotic David? Is this the same David that said, what is the matter with this army? Are they not going out and fighting Goliath? And he walked out there facing this nine foot six giant who'd killed probably a thousand men. And he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. Now we have David cowering. A chicken. And being responsible for killing one of his seals. Rangers. And then Nathaniel confronts him, doesn't he? He said, you know, David, you got a person out here. He's very rich, and he had one. And yet another person is very poor, and they have one little lamb. And that little lamb has been their family pet. 
rich man gets company and he comes over to the poor man, he said, I'm taking your lamb because I need to feed my company, my ego. David is hot. That man needs to be suffered four times. What does Nathaniel say? You are the man. You ever heard those words? What did David do? Oh, Lord, I've sinned. I've made a fool out of myself. I've sinned. I've made a mess of things. And then he writes this. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's what God did for us. There were ramifications of David's sin, but some of the greatest psalms have been written as a result of that particular confession. All this was accomplished, folks. Us being declared righteous. It was accomplished by His grace. As we said, one distinction between grace and mercy is that grace is God's favor toward the guilty, the lawbreakers, so it operates in the judicial realm. God saved us, declared us righteous when we did not deserve it. You know, as I look back over my life, I've been in the ministry since the age of 21. I've been preaching. Now that I'm 30, <laughs> now that I just had a birthday and you may wonder what I, how old I am, I had 82 birthdays. I look back over my life and you know what I say? Thank you, Lord, for your grace. I haven't earned anything and I have not deserved anything. You know what? You can pray for me if you want to pray for me is, did I finish well? I've seen a lot of people in their older years phase out. I don't want to do that. I want to burn out. Grace is a separate attribute of God. You know why it's a separate attribute of God? Because God is love. It's a separate attribute from love. God's love always existed because he's always loved his son. How long has God loved his son? How long has God been in existence? Forever. There's never been a beginning. Ever. Ever. And as far back as forever, God has always loved his son. But there's no grace until there's sin. Unmerited favor. When sin came, we saw God's grace. Adam. I told you you'd die the day you died, the day you ate the fruit. But in my grace, I'm going to let you live long enough to have children. Hence, you're here. I'm here. Even if you don't love God and you have nothing to do with God this morning and you could care less about God or even being here, let me tell you something. You're here. One reason you're here is because of God's grace. He could have wiped out Adam right then and there and been perfectly just, right? He didn't do it. He's gracious even when we're ungracious. And so without sin and without lost individuals, there is no grace. But grace, because of sin, that attribute of grace was brought out. 
So the way of saving men is totally apart from the way of law and works. Romans 4, verse 4 says, Now to, him, to the one who works, his wage is not cre cre credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies, declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. <laughs> Putting your faith and trust in him. Look at the extra bonus. And we would, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are heirs because of our union with Christ. If you knew you are going to inherit everything that Bill Gates owned, how would you live? If you knew you are going to inherit billions of do dollars, how would you live? I can tell you this, we'd all be spoiled. But do you know that you and I stand as heirs of far more than Bill Gates ever thought of having? We may consider ourselves poor. I'm not a rich man by any means. The only land I own is what I live on. I don't profess to have a lot of money. I never really cared to have a lot of money. You can't take it with you, can you? I've never seen a U-Haul behind hers. You're not taking it with you. You came into this life, as Job said, naked, and you're leaving naked. You came without anything, and you're leaving without anything. And the only thing you're leaving is the treasure that you and I stored up for ourselves in heaven. That's all. You can add, remember the guy that wanted to add barns? He said, oh, great crop. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add more bins. What did Jesus in that story tell us? God said, you fool. Tonight, you're going to die. Now whose will these barns be? What did Solomon say? I made all and worked for all his fortune to leave to somebody who's going to do what? Spend it all. But you are an heir if you're a believer. I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I think of my daughter-in-law. She's had Bible studies all over the country. And probably now that she's in dying, her ministry has vastly increased. And one day she's going to step out of this earth and into heaven. We hope it's a rapture, not her death. And then what? For me to live is what? Christ, and to die is what? It's gain for her. It's gain for us. Don't pity those who are believers who are in heaven. They're better off. Therefore, if you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, Galatians 4, 7, an heir through God, Ephesians 3, 6, to be specific, that Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise of Christ in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Get it all. <coughs> Who's going to inherit this earth? 
<coughs> Christ. We're going to get it all. And we're going to get it with him. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you've repented of your sin, you're not only saved from the guilt of your sin, you're not only declared righteous, you and I are heirs of eternal things and the riches that God has. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, having been saved by his grace. Do you know him? I'll be here after the service, and so will Bob, and, and some, of, some of our deacons will be here. And if you need further help or counsel, listen, we're here to help you. We're here to lead you to Jesus Christ, if you're willing. We'd be more than happy to show you from God's word how you can have eternal life through him. Let's stand for prayer. Father, what a privilege we have that we are justified, declared righteous. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each heart through the Spirit of God, and they would sense your calling, bow their neck, admit they're a sinner, repent of their sin, and place their full trust in the work of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who paid for their sin in their place, knowing that they can have eternal life and be heirs of God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.